Good afternoon and a warm welcome to you all. My name is David Hewan and from all of us at Vaughan Publishing, a joint venture between BBI, the Australian Institute of Theological Education and Garrett Publishing, I'm so grateful that you could join us today. I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I join you from. I pay my respects to the Wurundjeri elders, past, present and emerging. And I extend my respect as best I can to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait peoples from the many lands on which you join us from today. We come together to officially launch the release of the old and the new, Christian communities recontextualize faith in a change of error. In doing so, we celebrate the authors of this important new book, the late Professor Therese Dorsa and husband Jim, and pay tribute to their contributions they have made to school communities and Catholic education over many years. In the days leading up to Therese's untimely passing, she was connecting regularly with Karen Taylor, our publishing director, to make the book the best it could be. Her commitment to bettering Catholic education and its mission, indeed to you as educators and in turn your students and family, never wavered. We're joined today by Bishop Tim Norton and eminent educators, Dr. Patricia Heinmarsh, Dr. Paul Sharkey and Sister Catherine Mead. I'll introduce each in turn in due course. Today's webinar will be recorded and a link to the video will be sent to you in the coming week. The chat function and the Q&A function is open for any comments or reflections on the book, on Therese and her work, um, or indeed anything that the speakers might uh, raise. Um, indeed, if you have any questions, we'll endeavour to address as many as we can, time permitting. That's too much from me. So I'm going to hand over now to Trish Heinmarsh for a prayer and a reflection. Let me just uh, bring Therese in. So hopefully you can see Therese now. Uh, sorry, uh, Trish in. Um, Trish is Therese's beloved sister and a retired teacher and educational leader who has worked in Catholic education across Australia, most recently as Director of Catholic Education in Tasmania. Trish wrote Vaughan, uh, Vaughan Publishing's Educator's Guide to Catholic Curriculum and recently worked with us at Garrett Publishing on our Faith Today Ecological Spirituality Guide. Trish, over to you. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone, and very pleased that you confused me with Therese. I take I, that as a compliment. I, I do apologise. I'd, I'd like to begin with a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When someone found it, they hid it again, and then in their joy went and sold all they had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house, which brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. This work by Therese and Jim Dorsa could not be more timely. It explores how the kingdom of God can come to life anew in every time and place, each emerging context in human history. The kingdom of God, in the words of scripture scholar Frank Maloney, is the reigning presence of God. This is the author's favoured description. 
We see a current example of the reigning presence of God made visible afresh in the Mongolian church out on the geographical peripheries. Faith in the life, death and resurrection of Christ is being contextualized in Mongolian culture as a new and vital Catholic church community, barely 20 years old, enthusiastically receiving the mission of God and alive in the Holy Spirit. This book traces how the call to faith has evolved from Abraham, Moses, the prophets, and the early Christian communities, even until now, as the people of God interfaced with different cultures, adapting to historical challenges. God's original call to Abraham and his tribe to be a light and a blessing to the nations is passed on to all his spiritual descendants, including ourselves. We need to discern fresh ways to convey that blessing in the here and the now. The authors have skin in the game, passionate commitment in finding ways to address the major missionary challenges presented to the church by the dilution of faith in 20th century cultures like our own. Over time, the salt can lose some of its taste and the lamps grow dim. The critical concept of recontextualization of the gospel at the heart of this work provides a key to church renewal and reform. The thesis of the book relies heavily on scriptural, theological, anthropological, anthropological and missiological disciplines, thoroughly researched and done, which have informed the vision of Vatican II and now the pontificate of Pope Francis. Pope Francis himself is an exponent of recontextualization. The authors take courage from his address in Florence's cathedral, cathedral Santa Maria del Fiore in October 2015. Echoing Evangelia Gaudium, Francis preached that a church that is stuck with obsolete practices and forms, but culturally lacks a capacity to be meaningful, is not a church that can have a face that is supple, a body that moves and develops. Christian doctrine, he says, is not a closed system, but is living, able to raise questions, able to raise doubts, unsettle and enliven. Christian doctrine is called Jesus Christ. And further, the Pope adds, May the church be fermented by dialogue, encounter, unity. After all, our own formulations of faith are the fruit of dialogue and encounter among cultures, communities and various situations. We must not fear dialogue. On the contrary, says Francis, it is precisely confrontation and criticism that can help us to preserve theology from being transformed into ideology. In Australia and in Belgium and other Western countries concerned about the growing loss of religious life and spirituality, especially for the young, many Catholic leaders and organisations are following Pope Francis and his predecessors in seeking new ways of living and sharing the gospel in the change of era. This book is tailor-made for those people. The ones they serve are hungry for meaning in life, for truth in a time of obfuscation, obfuscation and lies, hope for a better future and a yearning for the gift of loving kindness and respectful regard. Christians have always recognised Christ <clears throat> as the fullness of truth. He's self-described as the way, the truth and the life. Pope Francis tells the world in Fratelli Tutti that all people of goodwill who seek truth are neighbours on this human pilgrimage towards fullness of life. They are to be warmly welcomed to bring their own gifts of wisdom and knowledge to the community table. We daily encounter those people in our families, towns, hospitals, schools, offices, clubs and social services. Through respectful dialogue and openness to the gospel, they can come to feel their hearts burning within them, experiencing something of the openness to the gospel. They can come to have that sense of grace of the Christian story and the kingdom of God among us. 
Within a flourishing community of faith, the baptised can be renewed and re-energised in their call to be disciples of Christ on mission to the world. The old and the new includes a case study of recontextualization in practice. The authors recount and evaluate the history of the groundbreaking Enhancing Catholic Schools project, better known as ECSI, implemented in Melbourne Archdiocesan schools between 2006 and 2022. The Melbourne initiative is one of hundreds of similar projects drawing on the intensive research in recontextualization being carried out at Catholic University in Leuven. This year, the St Vincent de Paul Society in Australia is engaged itself in recontextualizing through a national consultation process to renew and refresh its Catholic identity and its Vincentian spirit. The society has been seeking ways to shed the light of the gospel anew on human need in every particular place and time during more than 190 years, as the society spread to 101 countries and now stands at over a million followers. Its, its founder, young Catholic lawyer, Blessed Frederick Osenham, challenged his followers in the 1830s. Do not be afraid of new beginnings. Be creative, be inventive. You who have energy, who have enthusiasm, who want to do something of value for the future, be inventive, launch out, do not wait. Jesus spoke of new wineskins, leaven in the dough, treasure and the pearl of great price as signs of the kingdom. This book draws deeply from the wells of the Christian tradition. Its hero may well be the faithful steward in Matthew's gospel, the archetypal recontextualizer, able to bring forth from his storeroom new things as well as old. And so we are invited to prayer. We invoke God's spirit of wisdom and the double-edged sword of the word of God that can cut right to the heart to empower us to new things. May we greet the newness of each day as a sign of God's love alive within us, open to recognize Christ in all we meet. May we recognize the goodness that flows from the diverse peoples we encounter in our highly secularized society and in our parishes and workplaces. May we cherish the sacredness of the natural world that can speak to us of the divine and is our common home. May we commit to enlighten the burdens of those who are weighed down by suffering, exclusion and poverty, sharing in the suffering of the crucified one. May we open ourselves to the riches of sacred scripture and our part in its evolving story of humanity's covenant with God. And a moment of silence ourselves. And in conclusion, it's our hope that this book will be received with joy as a reliable framework for recontextualizing the gospel. May it prove a valuable and blessed guide for leaders and communities on mission to the whole of creation in a change of era. See, I am making all things new. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trish. Um, uh, that was an uh, outstanding beginning um, and wonderful prayer. Um, please know that Therese was very special to us at Vaughan um, and at Garrett Publishing and, of course, at BBI. Um, Dr. Paul Sharkey is the postgraduate coordinator at Catholic Theological College here in Melbourne. Many will know Paul from his work at uh, uh, Catholic Education um, Australia, uh, South Australia, or I beg your pardon. Sorry, just hang on half a moment. All right, and I'll just bring Paul in. I should have done that straight away. I do apologise, Paul. Um, uh, 
so many will know Paul from Catholic Education uh, South Australia and the Director of Mission and Education at Melbourne Ca Archdiocese Catholic School. After retiring from Max, Paul's been a senior advisor to the Catholic Education Commission of Victoria. He's a consultant in mission and identity for the Diocese of Parramatta and perhaps so much more. Paul's also the author of Vaughan Publishing's Educator's Guide to Catholic Identity and other Garrett titles. So how's that retirement working out for you, Paul? Thank you, David. My um, You sound a bit like my children, actually. They said, Dad, I thought you said you were going to retire. I actually never said that. Um, but, <laughs> uh, anyway, we're on a glide path, so, so that's a good thing. Um, but thank you, David, for the invitation to say some words um, this afternoon in, I think, to honour what Jim and Therese have contributed, not only in this text that we're launching today, but um, in the series of texts that they've written. I was taken with the statement on the dedication page, um, which I'll just quote from here, because I think it really applies um, as much to them as it does to Bishop Hilton Deacon, who they attributed um, or dedicated their book to. This book is dedicated to the memory of Bishop Hilton Deacon. We appreciate especially Hilton's capacity to bring together the new as well as the old in living his faith in the context of Australia and Timor-Leste. His life is a case study in mission and practice and a storehouse of insights into pursuing faith in the public square. We've been richly blessed by a life very well lived for others. Uh, I was just really struck with how that could be um, an epitaph really for Therese. Um, and it's a wonderful statement about the partnership that is Jim and Therese. Um, my association with Jim um, goes back further than Therese. Jim actually taught me physics in forms five and six back in the 70s and uh, he's easily the most intelligent teacher that I had in my years of schooling. Um, I remember him as being sports mad, and um, I can very clearly recall watching him skip one day, um, and he was like a boxer. It was just the rope was going around two and three times per jump, and I was just astonished, firstly, to see a man skip, but secondly, to see someone so coordinated um, and graceful and powerful in his approach. Um, I sadly can also remember flooding out Jim's physics lab as an unintended consequence of a last day prank that went horribly wrong. And I thought as I left school um, on that final day um, that I'd never see Jim again. Um, and I've learned that life's full of strange twists and turns. Um, I can't recall exactly how I came to be working with Jim and Therese uh, on the book that you mentioned, David, um, but I can vividly recall walking up the driveway of a house in Pasco Vale South where Jim and Therese were waiting to discuss the book that we had on the planning. Um, I thought we might meet in an office somewhere, but Jim was very clear we'd work in his sister's place and we'd do so in the context of a home where hospitality could be extended properly. Any fears I had with meeting up with him again after so many years of the schooling fiasco evaporated immediately um, with the warmth of the hospitality that Therese and Jim extended. And um, that warmth and friendship and hospitable context for working together, I learned was just typical of the way they operated. Notwithstanding the geniality of the welcome, uh, we very quickly got down to work and I'd have to say it was one of the more rigorous engaged and engaging discussions I'd experienced to that time about Catholic mission as it applies to schools. And I came to know that that would always be the case in working with them, uh, to experience a wonderful mix of hospitality, creativity, rigour, intelligence, an unremitting commitment to pursuing the faith in the public square, to use their words. I said in my contribution to the commendations which appear at the start of the book, that recontextualization is a word that's misused by teachers more often than it's used properly. Uh, in some jurisdictions, the terms associated with a postmodernist, nihilist, relativist approach that's 
therefore rejected um, as being not appropriate to use in a Catholic school, that kind of recontextualizing approach. On the other side of the ledger, within jurisdictions that favour a recontextualizing approach, most teachers uh, claim to be using it in their approach. Um, and I, I, along with some others, had noticed that it's a term that's become so frequently used in such diverse ways that it's become almost meaningless. And so some of us decided to interview some religious education teachers to document the different ways in which the term was understood as a guide for practice. And it wasn't surprising from um, my perspective anyway that a key finding was that there was confusion and a lack of clarity in regard to the recontextualizing approach. The approach from drawing on the old and the new um, that Jim and Therese address in their book. I was delighted when I heard they'd be taking that project on because I knew that the fruits of their labour would be rigorous, comprehensive, accessible and practical. And I wasn't disappointed when Therese sent me a copy of the book to review. The reason why the topic, as Trish has just said so um, typically eloquently, um, is that we're in a change of eras and new approaches are necessary if our renderings of Catholic faith are to be culturally plausible. Because as John Paul II noted, a faith that hasn't been enculturated is a faith that hasn't been received. My sense is that in this change of epoch time, we're sadly increasingly seeing a polarization of approaches. At one extreme, we see people who want to reinvent Catholic faith so that it's quote unquote relevant to their students. But unfortunately, the versions of Catholic faith they're promoting are very superficial and not faithful to the precious tradition that we receive by those faith-filled Catholics who've gone before us. At the other extreme, we see people who care little for the cultural context of the believers because they see that the timeless truths of Catholic faith don't need to be recontextualized. As one uh, such person said to me, if it was true 100 years ago, why isn't it true now? No regard at all for context. Of course, neither of these extremes work, and we need bearers of the tradition who know how to draw deeply from the Catholic world to offer their fellow believers not a rigid and closed set of formulations, but a living, life-giving water that can nurture new expressions that are as faithful to the tradition as they are meaningful for those who receive it. As Teresa's mentioned, uh, sorry, Teresa, I've done it again. Um, David, taken your lead. Um, uh, Jim and Therese consider the enhancing Catholic school analysis in chapter 13 of the book. And those who are familiar with the analysis will know how the Council of the Catholic University in Leuven provides to school um, is could be summarised under the following three ways. If we're going to draw from the new and the old, we need to take a both and approach. We need to engage critically with the tradition at the same time as we're being open to transcendence. We need to respect Catholic faith and at the same time, respect the cultural context of those who receive it. And as Jim and Therese um, have said in their first work, if you're going to lead a Catholic school, you need to be able to do theology. And that's what respecting culture and faith actually calls of anyone, the subject that lies at the heart, of, the task that lies at the heart of missiology that Jim and Therese have been so devoted to over so many decades. And thirdly, being inclusive and at the same time um, drawing explicitly from the treasures of Catholic faith, not being either inclusive or Catholic, but being inclusive in a Catholic way or being Catholic in an inclusive way. They're the councils that um, come through uh, from the ECSI analysis. Uh, and as Therese has noted, there's many other uh, approaches to the task of drawing um, on the new and old um, that people could grapple with. Um, David, I can think of no better way to close these reflections than to quote from an email that Therese sent me earlier this year as she and Jim were finishing the book. I think it captures the relationality, intelligence and deep commission, the commitment to mission that I've always seen in their partnership, this remarkable couple, Jim and Therese. 
Dear Paul, this was written in January, so it seems like yesterday. Dear Paul, a very happy new year to you all as well and to the Sharkey family. There was always um, a relational approach. Thanks so much for your commendation, which I think picks up exactly what we tried to do. Working missiologically as scholars, we try to draw on a range of disciplines to elucidate an issue confronting the Catholic faith community. In this case, the need to recontextualize the faith in a change of era for the benefit of young people and their communities. Teachers have a very big task in front of them. I admire many of them for what they are doing to meet the challenge. We are pleased to be part of the conversations around recontextualization. May they continue fruitfully. All the best for your life and work in the year to come. I know some leaders will look to you for help in leading their communities. Lucky them. Also, you're allowed to rest. Therese was always such an encouraging person and supportive person. Blessings and good wishes. Could you let me know the title by which we should acknowledge your words? Thanks, Paul. Blessings, Therese. The legacy of Jim and Therese's work comes into sharper relief for me now that Therese has experienced the ultimate recontextualization. The words that Jim and Therese have written together live on and will provide, as one Catholic educator said to me, for decades to come. Thank you, Jim and Therese. Yeah, thank you, Paul. What a terrific uh, testament and reflection of Therese's work and contribution and, of course, that of Jim's uh, as well. And I'm pretty sure Jim is watching on um, as well um, today. I didn't want to tell you that before in case I put too much pressure on you, which I'm sure I didn't. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'll bring in um, Bishop Tim Norton from sunny Queensland. I'm most jealous of the fact that it's 23 degrees and apparently there's only one cloud in the sky today. So it's God's country up there, isn't it? Uh, um, so I welcome Bishop Tim. Um, Bishop uh, Tim is the auxiliary bishop um, for the Archdiocese of Brisbane. He professed as a seminarian in the Divine Word Missionaries, uh, SVDs, uh, in Mexico in 1986 and was ordained in Sydney five years later. Uh, Bishop uh, Tim has a strong interest in culture and the mission of God in the world, whatever shape or form that that may take. Um, and given his focus on mission and Therese, we've asked uh, Bishop Tim to say a few words. Little did Bishop uh, know that in the fried and print of his job description, uh, uh, was launching books. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Bishop Tim, for joining us today and and making the time um, to talk about the new and the old um, and mission in general. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, David. So lo lovely to be here and to talk about mission. Uh, Jim and Therese, I only met them once and that was through uh, a very close friend and colleague, Noel Connolly. Uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, also someone who Jim and Therese uh, spends a good deal of time with. So, look, having read this book, so many elements of it that I have found quite exciting, the biblical, the missiological and the cultural specifically. Um, so the, the journey of each of those, each of those areas. Um, and even some of the terminology used, we begin to indwell the text as we recognise the call to recreate the biblical story repeatedly as the context shifts from the old to the new, reconstructing the past in memory and constructing the future in expectation. And so the idea that narratives change across time, that Jesus' story has to be retold and retold but in new spaces and in new places. And as a missionary, I guess that's um, that's something that I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with. Um, and the idea that Christian leaders through time have changed the narratives of salvation history recontextualizing it and uh, including the Jesus story and in the book of Acts, their own story from a very early time. Um, so from the missiological perspective, um, it, they speak of uh, the experiences of missionaries leading to some of them thinking the unthinkable. Now, I well know that missionaries historically have done some really poor things, but have done some great things uh, also. 
Um, but in thinking the unthinkable, they were doing that because uh, they realised this was not the best way to evangelise those without a European background. Well, I belong to the Society of the Divine Word, the SVD. There's 6,000 of us, and for the last eight years before coming to Brisbane, I'd been tasked with running the renewal courses or sabbatical courses for our guys, all of whom after 10 years' service has a finally professed brother or priest um, who'd come to this house outside Rome and we would run the courses in uh, English or Spanish, Portuguese, or uh, indeed in Indonesian. 1,500 of the 6,000 of us are uh, Indonesian. And so the great majority of our guys do not have this European background. And so they're in different parts of the world, most working in places that are not their first culture, um, really trying to put into practice a whole lot of what this book is talking about. Um, so in Mexico, for me, the Day of the Dead, for example, the, the um, uh, November 2, uh, which is All Souls Day, it was celebrated in huge ways that, that absolutely bowled me over, but I became all a part of this and thought this was all wonderful. Um, try to think of new ways to, or better ways, uh, to be really evangelising. When I first got to Mexico City, this huge barrio that I lived in with about 100,000 people, um, one of the uh, directors from the Archdiocese was to divide the parish up into this grid pattern and be celebrating liturgical uh, Eucharist actually out in the streets. And I did this, and I did this over and over, and it was a wonderful way to evangelise. This came from the Archdiocese. When I went to the deanery meeting, I found that I was the only one doing this. This was the foreign guy who was doing these sorts of things, but they were wonderful ways uh, to be telling the Jesus story and to be actually working with people who would listen to the Jesus story and then reflect upon it because a whole lot of them were not literate. They couldn't read the Jesus story. They had to actually hear it from other people. Um, wonderful experiences, really. The SVDs I worked with uh, in those courses uh, who were coming from all different parts of the world, um, now a number of them I worked out had PTSD, good numbers of them. Um, guys had been kidnapped, they'd been beaten, they'd been really under pressure trying to look after the people with whom they were in ministry uh, in ways that I guess I've faced a bit of that myself, um, but still looking for the best way to evangelise. This whole uh, conversation I have about culture, Therese and Jim, um, quoting Louis Luspetak and uh, Paul Hibbert. Uh, Luspetak is a, was a Slovakian-born SVD um, anthropologist. And uh, one of the greatest quotes that I recall, because I do a bit of work in culture and I, I quote him, uh, is to say that we are the architects of culture. So we have a whole lot to do with culture. We create culture. And for those of us who are teachers, um, you go to different schools, even in the same city, and you see different cultures in those places. So the people there, and it's usually leadership, who, who create the culture, sometimes they're wonderfully thriving cultures, and other times they're quite toxic. But we have a chance to create culture. Um, Therese, Therese and Jim also talk about these major changes in church, church teachings flowing from experiences of missionaries working in cultures that were not their first. Um, and saying that the cultures generally are, have times when they're stable, but then have times when they're not stable. They're in processes of transition. So all cultures are in some level of transition. And there's Pope Francis. So he's the first non-European Pope, as we know, for some centuries, um, taking important steps to recontextualize the Christian church, the Catholic church particularly. Um, but interestingly, Therese and Jim make regular reference to the importance of language and culture. And so truth can be expressed through language and through culture. Uh, and certainly the, I've had to learn uh, some other languages um, in my time as a missionary. It's quite common. Uh, most recently, um, just a few years ago now, I was part of a small team running an interculturality workshop with 200 religious sisters from many parts of the world there in Rome. And uh, we were working through uh, a number of things like enculturation, acculturation, inculturation, all those things quite important. They come up in the book too. Enculturation being me learning how to be a boy and a man in Australia. Um, acculturation, me going to Mexico and learning how to refashion and understand myself in a whole other place and space. And inculturation being the, 
the, the, the way that uh, gospel and culture interact with one another. Well, there am I waxing lyrical about this stuff, but I'm talking to the translators afterwards. It was in English, French, um, English, French, Spanish, and Italian. In, uh, French, in Spanish and Italian, enculturation and acculturation are the same word. There's no difference. They use the same word. So you're trying to work across boundaries of, of, of culture and language can be really complex. Another thing I was doing in the uh, the work there with the guys uh, in Italy coming from all around the world, um, I decided it was important to add to the course uh, something about professional standards. Well, of course, an Australian is going to want to talk about professional standards. Uh, so that at least this hugely painful and difficult process we've been through here in the Royal Commission would uh, bring about some good in other spaces. So I'd be putting up some of the material from um, uh, Towards Healing up on the screen and uh, trying to get a bit graphic about it, watching guys screw up their eyes. And I'm I'm sort of saying, um, you, you get what I'm saying? And I'm getting these nods. Uh, and then I, I thought, well, I said to one of the Indonesian guys, so what's that in Indonesian? And he said, I don't know. We, we don't say anything like that. So I said to the, um, the Vietnamese guy, Vietnamese? No, we don't have those words. Uh, Swahili, Kikongo? No. So... We've got to actually have words to make concepts, to actually be thinking about things together. So language and culture, absolutely critical. Again, Jim and Therese talking about this over and over. So then I actually did some case studies with the guys and they ate the case studies. Um, they thought the case studies were great, are really acting things out quite well. And I suppose one of the final points I want to make is that as we recontextualize, we don't do it on our own. So the case studies brought to my attention the fact that guys from different parts of the world working in other parts of the world were actually doing some really intensive and complex work in the area of professional standards and sexual abuse. They're doing it together. So not one was doing it or the other. They're actually doing this together and really doing some great learning uh, and this cross-fertilisation between them. So probably one of the most important parts, I think, of the book for me um, is that this whole process of recontextualization is something that we are doing together. It's a great invitation with some excellent, excellent um, steps as to how we might do some of this. And I think it's particularly good for education, but I'm not an educator. I've been walking into schools here in the Archdiocese the first time I'm walking into schools at all, and I totally, totally get um, just the, the courage and the bravery of um, teachers are trying to manage in schools today. I think they do a wonderful job, the RE teachers included. So today it's my duty to officially launch Therese and Jim Dawes' new book, The New and the Old Christian Communities Recontextualise Faith in a Change of Era and ask educators around Australia to consider the discoveries, the observations, research and recommendations of Therese and Jim as, they, as your work and your day-to-day -day missions and guide your school communities. So there's some truly excellent material there that allow you to focus in your collaborative efforts at recontextualization, which is just critical for us today in this church, in this place, at this time, and listening to the voices of the marginalised, as, um, as was evident from what Jesus was telling us from the first story, from when he was hanging around, uh, to listen to those voices of marginalised, and that will give us the spirit to actually recontextualise together. So it's telling the story of Jesus, new ways with new faces in our time and our place. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, and congratulations on your second launch. Uh, a book you you absolutely nailed it if I <laughs> if I can uh, if I can say that and thank you very much and of course you know I think um, the fact that you reflected on um, the diverse communities that you've yes. had the opportunity to um, uh, evangelize with to talk with to to share 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 bread with uh, and the like of course our schools are, are, are not you know, Anglo white Christian, not anymore. Not anymore. I, I get the opportunity to walk into schools and I'm, I'm just absolutely amazed at just how um, diverse our communities are and, and the way in which we need to share the Jesus story uh, with those, uh, with those people, with those families, with those kids that come from different faiths or no faiths.
Um, so thank you very much uh, for your time. I am going to now add, I'm going to replace Tim. Just excuse me, Tim, you're not replaceable, but just. I'm oh, happy to be replaced though. <laughs> and I'm going to bring in the lovely sister Catherine Mead uh, here for a moment. Uh, not only is uh, Catherine um, a sister of St. Joseph's, um, she's also a doctor of education. Um, Catherine's currently the chair of BDI's Mission and Education Board, a role that Therese had herself held for very, very many years. So them's a big shoes to fill, Catherine. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, um, Jared uh, has complete faith in, uh, and the board have faith in your ability to take us forward. Um, you're currently the, uh, you've probably got many, many roles and I'm missing probably some of them, Catherine, but you're the leader of Catholic identity and mission in the Northern Territory. Um, well, and looking forward to tropo season, no doubt up there. Um, and you're a member of the Catholic uh, Education Council of Northern Territory. So I'm going to hand over to you um, a uh, tough gig to fill after Bishop Tim and Paul and and uh, and Trish, of course, but uh, I'm sure you'll bring us home. Thanks for joining us today, uh, Catherine. All right, thank you, David, and um, thanks for putting the wind up me <laughs> after all of those, um, those yes. uh, speeches. Thank you. But I just acknowledge, too, that I am on Narakia land, on the land of the saltwater people. Um, on whose country that I minister, pray and speak from today. And I'm just very mindful of the elders past, present and emerging and particularly in this journey towards the referendum um, and seeking justice and equity in this country. So like many of you participating in this webinar, um, I acknowledge the extraordinary spirit that was within Therese Dorsa, a powerful spirit of God that emanated from Therese in her relationship with us all. Um, and that was further expressed in her brilliance, insight, wisdom and intellect and her extraordinary capacity alongside Jim to ground that scholarly research into practice. Once upon a time as a principal in my latter years, um, in that role, the work of Therese and Jim, uh, I was able to read and was introduced to it by Catherine Clark, one of my sisters, who used to come back from editorial board meetings and tell me about these evenings of dangerous ideas they used to have at the end, at the close of the meeting. And of course, that very much caught my attention because it was wonderful to think that there was a scholarly approach to mission thinking for our times. Um, that first text, Explorers, Guides and Meaning Makers, made so much um, of an impact for myself when I was trying to articulate mission in practice uh, alongside my colleagues in schools um, and I appreciate everything that was just said about the changing nature of our school communities in Catholic education across the nation. Um, so to engage, so the publications released since from BBI have influenced, I know, many teachers, leaders and administrators in mission thinking and are a testament to those whose shoulders we stand upon today and I particularly honour Therese and her colleague, I was pleased to hear you mention Bishop Tim um, and friend, Father Noel Conley, yep. who have shaped so much of our mission thinking for these times. Yep. So my task this afternoon is to share something of the role of the BBI editorial board, the brainchild, as I see it, of Therese and Jim Dorser, in collaboration with BBI, uh, as an integral extension of their depth of experience, research and knowledge in the field. Just a couple of weeks ago before Jim gave himself a holiday, he uh, emailed me to tell me that he had sent a package in the post and um, this beautiful little package came and in the most lovely of handwriting that one um, cherishes these days was a note from Jim with the USB, um, with all of the work of the board since 2010. Um, I felt it was a gift to keep in trust and to hold. Uh, he felt that somebody else needed to have a copy of it all. And um, I was flipping through that in preparation for today. And, you know, in itself, the minutes that have been recorded from those meetings speak so much about the journey that the board has been on. But not only the board, I think about mission in Catholic education across this nation. Um, so Therese, as Professor of Mission and Culture at BBI for so many years, was so keenly aware of the needs of educators in Catholic education and schools across this nation. 
with a growing recognition of the international issues impacting on, on, uh, on Catholic education. In 2010, the BBI editorial board outlined its vision and purpose in its charter, and by 2014, the charter was revised with the following mandate, and I quote from the charter, in a secular and increasingly pluralist society, it is necessary to provide specific and scholarly attention to the ways in which Catholic education advances the church's religious mission within an evolving society and culture. This dynamic plays out in the many aspects of teaching and learning, of leadership, administration, school improvement and community building, all of which are central to the educational life of schools and school systems. The Catholic Church as a global institution continues to grapple with the enormous ideational changes impacting on the human environments in which she seeks to pursue the mission of Jesus. The Church constantly seeks to develop and renew its vision and mission, aware that without such attention, the local churches that comprise the Church along with their ministries tend to become mired in institutional maintenance at the expense of its mission. I think we can say in 2014, we can still say yes to that. Those of us who are teachers, practitioners, leaders, administrators and system leaders who deeply care that children and young people, staff and leaders are able to encounter a meaningful and authentic expression of Catholic education can attest to the reality that the tension of articulating mission in these liminal times and in the change of era that we've heard today is both an exciting opportunity and a significant challenge. Once again, I quote from the editorial board charter, the mission and education series that we have seen published throughout these years responds to this situation, recognizing that education is a major means by which the church re renews herself and carries out her mission, God's mission in the world. It aims therefore to advance thinking, discussion and practice in regard to core aspects of Catholic schooling, both in Australia and beyond. Further, the charter identified the goal of the BBI mission and education series, and again, I quote, to assist educational leaders at all levels to interpret the experience of teaching, leading, administering, and pursuing school improvement and community building in Catholic schools and systems in the light of mythological insights drawn from our religious and cultural traditions. We certainly have a, a lovely gift that's been given to us to continue. Teresa's legacy lives on in the many publications that she and Jim have co-authored and in Teresa's extraordinary capacity to scan the environment, seek out the giftedness, the expertise, the intellect and research of others to address the topical issues in Catholic education that need to inform and form current practice. Hence, publications such as Guides, Explorers and Meaning Makers, The Catholic Curriculum, Leading for Mission, Pedagogy in the Curriculum, New Ways of Living the Gospel, accompanied by accessible and practical educator guides such as Catholic Identity, Service Learning, Mission in Practice, Immersion for Mission, have all been before us as readily accessible and usable resources. As an educator familiar and in touch with every age and stage of learning, Therese was easily able to ground the academic rigour, the intellectual muscle, and I might add the courageous heart required to grapple with the formation needs of Catholic educators in a way that could practically be applied, be it in schools, system and governing bodies in Catholic education. The current BBI editorial board, now in the wake of Therese's legacy, continues its work with a desire to revisit its charter and to respond to the vital need for formation for mission to be accessible, contextually relevant, and meaningful in the here and now. Formation for mission is what Jill Gowdy has referred to as the sleeping giant in Catholic education, and hence requires the attention, priority, and resources for educators to be easily able to access just in time or a point in time thinking that is contextually relevant and practically applied. 
Trazer's wisdom, along with Jim's, in being able to identify the formation required for teachers, leaders and systems, continues to influence the editorial board to take up the mantle of integrating faith, life, learning and culture as the board sets its priorities and strategic directions into the future. Trace has influenced the preparation of an extension to educators' guides in student retreats and Mary McKillop, the educator, and are both currently waiting in the wings, some of Trace's language, to meet the needs of educators who are seeking to make meaning, to recontextualise faith, identity and mission in the Australian context. The board is further dreaming of the need to respond to the current milieu that has been identified in considering the possibility of an exploratory study on mission education that I understand Jim is continuing to research, a study on the concept of dialogue, an educator's guide to pastoral care to provide a Catholic understanding of its tradition and practice to accompany the current wellbeing agenda. The editorial board faces significant challenges in strategizing for new and creative ways to publish resources for mission thinking, encounter and dialogue, as it continues to be central in informing emerging trends in Catholic education. The editorial board has relied on a number of sources to sponsor its publications. Initially, Catholic education systems and religious institutes across the nation where the were the main sponsors of publications for the formation of educators within their systems and their institutes. With the increasing levels of bureaucracy and corporatization of systems and institutes, the danger of mission thinking being left on the shelf could become a reality at a time when an understanding of mission in contemporary times in education is critically required. So the ongoing aims of the Mission and Education series is to produce each year a small number of high quality, well-researched publications that address significant aspects of Catholic schooling in Australia from within a missiological framework. In this change of era, there's a hunger and a thirst for accessible, relevant, contextual, ongoing, purposeful formation of teachers, staff, leaders, system leaders, as we dialogue with the reality and I quote, that the Catholic Church as a global institution continues to grapple with the enormous ideational changes impacting on the human environments in which she seeks to pursue the mission of Jesus. So the editorial board is grateful for your participation this evening in continuing the legacy and generative work of the late Therese Dorsa and alongside Jim now in being meaning makers for mission in these times in our Catholic education communities the Catholic Church locally and universally and in our nation and world who are so much in need of the incarnational Christ to be ever present. So may we, as we keep continuing this work and pick up the mantle that Therese has left with the board, may we keep humming along as Therese did with the heartbeat of God's mission. Thank you, David. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. And, uh, um, I think the work that the Mission and Education Board um, as a collective um, have done, um, I can testify that this is world-leading stuff. I've had the opportunity over many years, uh, well, pre-COVID at least, um, to travel as far as New York City and talk to educators within that system. Um, in Toronto, um, in Los Angeles. And uh, I've often um, uh, quite uh, um, surprisingly for me, gifted copies of books to these people uh, and encouraged them to read it because whilst we have different schooling systems across the globe and Australia are very lucky in that the government fund some things, um, the people who read those books come back to me and, and say, this is just outstanding work and we wish we could do this within our systems. And I often say, well, why can't you? And why wouldn't you buy a thousand copies? Uh, that doesn't ever happen. Uh, uh, however, let me just bring everybody back in. Um, we're not going to have time for questions. In fact, there's very few. 
Um, um, let me just bring, if I can, everybody in um, who's been on. Um, but I would like to thank Michael, who's been uh, very... Um, uh, adding in comments throughout the afternoon. Um, so very uh, thankful for Michael um, on the chat, and I'll share those uh, comments with our panellists tonight. Um, please support Therese and Jim's The New and the Old, or indeed uh, Paul's book, Trisha's book, or any other book within the Mission and Education um, series. Um, you can buy them from uh, vaughanpublishing.com.au. Alternatively, contact your local bookshop and support them. Um, in these challenging times, um, those small local bookstores need your help more than ever. Please don't buy via Amazon. Buy local, support local businesses um, where you can or come straight to Garrett as well. Um, uh, on behalf of everybody here today, um, Thank you, Bishop Tim, um, Trish, uh, Catherine, uh, Paul. Um, I thank you very much. I thank you too for the time you spend in preparing um, for today's talk. Please look out for an email from Garrett Publishing in the next week with the link to today's recording. Finally, if I may, many of us went to bed this evening 22 years ago with no thought that the next morning our world would change forever. Especially on this day, each year, I reflect on the thousands who said their good nights with loved ones for the last time. One never knows what a new day has in store. Um, let's live out each day to the fullest and never miss a chance to let those dearest to us know we love them. So tonight, if you have somebody in your life you love, please tell them that you love them. Oh, it's, nice. um, it's a personal, uh, you know, it's very personal to me, 9-11. Um, um, on that note, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And from all of us at Vaughan Publishing, that is BBI, Tate and Garrett Publishing. Thanks for your ongoing support. Good afternoon. Go well and go with love. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.